Hi, David Ellenstein here, Artistic Director of North Coast Repertory Theater. Thank you for tuning in today to our theater conversations. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. That would help us out a lot. Thank you. Hello, it's my great pleasure today to be joined by my friend, Melinda Lopez, the uh, extraordinary playwright, actor, and human being. Thank you for being here and talking to me today, Melinda, and sharing a little bit about yourself with the North Coast Rep audience. We so appreciate it. Thank um, you. We were lucky enough at uh, North Coast Rep to uh, commission uh, Melinda some years back to write a play, and she wrote the play Becoming Cuba which we produced the premiere of, I'm happy to say. Uh, but before that, I, w- I got to direct Melinda's play, Sonia Flu at the Coconut Grove Playhouse, which is where we met. And I also got to direct the premiere of her play, Alexandros, at the Laguna Playhouse. And we've become f- friends, and here we are. Yeah. So Melinda, first thing I wanna ask you is, you were an actor first for a long time, uh-huh. and then you started, you kind of transitioned into doing more playwriting. How did that happen, and why? Uh... Uh, I actually have an answer to this, which is great. Um, I love answers. I love answers. It's a little <laughs> long, but uh, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. So yeah, so I was that, you know, I was that kid, I was that first grader that always wants to be in the play. And I mean, I don't come from a theater family and no one in my family does theater. And uh, I just always loved it and I always wanted to be on stage. And um, I studied theater in college and after college, I, I worked at a Shakespeare company and, and um, I did all that training. And, um, and uh, 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 I, when, it, when I was in my early thirties, I moved to Minneapolis with my husband um, and we were living in a new city and um, you know, trying to get work. And so, uh, one of the things I was doing a lot of is staged readings, which I don't know if you do staged readings, David, at North Coast Rep, but yes. so it's like when a playwright has an early draft of a play and they're trying to figure out, does the second act make sense? You know, does this joke funny? Um, is anything happening? Are people interested? So uh, they'll bring in actors or you just give them pizza and people will read the play out loud. And so I was doing a lot of these and I really, really loved the process of you know, getting into it with the play and the playwright and like, why does this happen here? And what if this, and um, I'm confused here and I love this moment and can we have more of that? And I love that process. And um, I came home from a reading and I turned on the light in my apartment and I, something went bling, bling, bling. (laughs) And I thought, um, okay, I'm putting a lot of my energy and attention into supporting someone else's artistic vision right? I'm part of someone else's vision. Do I have a vision? And it was literally just a question I asked myself, like, do I have anything to say? And so uh, I didn't know the answer, but I started fooling around with writing. And uh, because I was an actor, I think I, I hear the world in dialogue. So when I, if I think about, like, I started telling stories that I already knew the answer to. I I, I knew what happened, like family stories. Like the time that Thanksgiving when everyone got in a fight or when the turkey fell on the floor or the pig roast that went terribly wrong. And, but I hear uh, voices. Like I don't describe the scenery. I hear people talking. And in my case, it was people in speaking in two languages. um, And it was a lot of people talking at once. And um, uh, I started writing scenes. I started writing monologues. Um, and, and that's how I started writing. And I think it's worth telling the whole story because I think it matters that I started writing because I, I didn't know what I had to say. Some people start writing because they know they have to tell us, they have to write, make something better, or they have to, they have an agenda. And I didn't start writing that way. I started writing because I was curious about what might happen if I paid attention to the things I was thinking about. And if I paid attention to the things that mattered to me, not to anyone else. Um, And that's how my plays started, like the genesis. Um, A lot of them are related to my experience being a bicultural person. Um, 
my family is from Cuba. I grew up in Massachusetts. You know, there's a con lot of contradictions there, a lot of, a lot of humor there. Um, uh, and, you know, the next thing I realized was that I had a lot to say about, you know, what we call now the Latin X experience. But for me, it was just an experience of growing up in a place where my family wasn't from and trying to find a way to belong like feeling like you have a home in two places or that you have allegiances to two different languages. Um, and, you know, then it turned out that some people thought it was fun to listen to. And so like, then you become a produced playwright. You can, you know, you can write without anyone ever reading them or seeing them. And that's also wonderful, right? It's like a way of exploring who we are. So, so you're saying when, when you started, you didn't know what you had to say and you wanted to write and figure, is that still sort of true when you write a new play? Do you still feel it's the same or are you now more like focused when you start? Well, so, I mean, I get really interested in um, things that happened, like either people I know that they lived through some crazy experience or I hear about a historical event that's really interesting to me and I try to figure out why things happen the way they do. A lot of my plays are like, how did we get here kind of plays. Like Sonia Flew is a how did we get here kind of play where you know um, a, a, a families chose to send their children out of a country uh, going through a revolution. You know, they, 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 they sent their children away rather than raise them in a place where they didn't feel they would be safe, right? Like, so, but how do you get to that point? And, and so, like it's still a process of discovery, but I might know, like I might know the end of the play or I might know who the characters are in the play. Um, uh, and one of the things I, I guess one of the things I've learned as I've been working, like uh, you make something and then someone tells you what it is and then they <laughs> tell you, oh, you're this kind of writer. And it's like, okay, that's, if you say so. So um, because I like to put um, women in the middle of my plays, you know, and I'm particularly interested in, in women who have my similar background, who might be from a Latin American country, um, especially when I started writing, like I didn't see a lot of those women on stage. I didn't see a woman with two graduate degrees, you know, who runs a business and is married to a man of a different faith. Like that's interesting to me. So I started putting these more complicated very flawed characters. And so then people say, oh, well, you're, that's political. And I'm like, well, what's political about it? Right. But what I understand it now is that, you know, putting a woman at the center of your play is making a statement and putting a woman of color at the center of your play is making a statement. And so I'll, I'll own that. Like, right. I'm okay with that. And so it's become more intentional. Hopefully what we do in art is always making a statement of some kind, you know, to somebody. And it may be a different statement to different people. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, 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 and so much is about the response. So much is about how the play is received or the story is received, right? Because um, someone likened it, uh, oh, it's Maria Irene Fornes. There's a great documentary that she's um, about her life right now. But she says, like, writing a play is like you have a recipe and you make the food, but you have to give it to someone. Like people have to eat the food that you make. And that's what a play is like. It's like, if it's just sitting there, you know, in the pages, it doesn't really mean anything until a director comes in and says, oh, I see, I see it yeah. this way, or designers and, and then actors come and they do their magic, right? right. And it's so thrilling because you're like, wow, I didn't know that all that happened. <laughs> I didn't know that person, that character cried there. So, so, so Melinda, you, you've written uh, uh, quite a few full length plays yeah. uh, and you've been, um, a, you've been teaching playwriting a lot. You, you were a um, uh, playwright in residence at the Huntington Theater for quite a few years and you're yeah. teaching at several colleges, I believe. Is that still mm -hmm. true? It's still true. Um, I, I have yeah. MFA playwrights at Boston University and then a few other places. Yeah, yeah. And, but you've also, uh, while concurrently written a new play, one person play that you yeah. perform yourself. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you so, talk a little bit about that and also why that came to be? Yeah. 
So, um, uh, mm. so my uh, solo show is called Mala, um, and it's it should be still available to stream. Um, it was actually uh, the PBS affiliate um, taped recorded a show um, back in 2018 that in, when I was in performance, and so they put together this beautiful. Um, uh, video that you can stream now if you go to um, WGBH and uh, that's the local affiliate um, and the name of the play is Mala. You can just Google it. Uh, I think it's probably available to stream um, up until May. Anyways, so um, uh, Mala is a one woman show that is um, an unsentimental, uh, honest and often really hilarious look. <laughs> <laughs> um, at um, caring for our parents as they age. Um, it's based on my experiences. Um, I was a caretaker for both my parents at the end of their lives. And when I was um, experiencing that, which, you know, is over several years, um, I found that it was very difficult for me to write. Um, but what I could do was um, jot down notes on my iPhone, um, especially when things got very crazy or something funny happened or, or something terrible happened. And so I accidentally compiled a number of very short, panicked notes to myself. Because um, I felt like I didn't want to forget what was happening. It was really hard. It's to me, the kind of thing that um, once you're through it, you intentionally forget what happened. And I didn't want to forget. It felt important to record it in, 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 speci in its specificity. Yeah. And so to put together a show um, uh, that has lots of moments of, um, you know, confronting what it means to be mortal and um, um, what it's like to be asked to be everything to the people who love you so much and who gave you everything and to feel like sometimes you're not up to the job. Um, um, it, it's a lot of addressing m my failures as a daughter or, or, or my, um, my trying to make things work. Um, mala is drawn from, um, uh, it's a Spanish word that means uh, bad. Um, and, and what I say in the play is um, um, mala is not, not just that you've done something bad, but that you are in your core bad. <laughs> and there are moments where you, you just feel like that, that you, you're, you're, you're never going to get this right. And so it's funny, it's bracing, it's, yeah. um, it's deeply felt. Linda, and I've got to go. I have gotta, to go watch this. You, you know why? Well, I know because you, you didn't my live with us. who lives with us is about to be 94. Oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's a blessing. It's, I have it's to a go blessing. watch this. And you will, you will. So, so I think you might enjoy Because what I found, David, was like living through it. Um, uh, two things were true. One was that I've never felt so alone. And the second was everyone I knew was going through it at this time. And both of those were, we couldn't talk to each other about it. And so I wanted to get an opportunity for people who either have lived it or are living it or are going to live it to like, maybe we can open the door a little bit to yeah. be okay with talking about how difficult it is yeah. and how wonderful it is and how you know, hard it is and all of the complexity. Well, I, I, uh, I, when I tell people stories about what has occurred, which has made yeah. me crazy or angry, yeah. or people tend to laugh. Yeah. And, and when I can step back a little bit, I can see the humor too. It's just hard yeah. when you're living it to see yeah. that it has a humor to it as well. Yeah. Um, uh, in the play, there are um, short, a few stories from um, friends who, who sort of pop up to tell their like anecdote and uh, like, and everyone will have a story too. You start saying, oh, my mother, and they're like, oh my God, my father, right? But, but it's, it's also, it's a profoundly human experience. Yeah. It's one we're not good at communicating about, like what, how do we want the end of our lives to look? Right. Um, it's also, you know, what I keep coming back to is how fortunate one is to have that experience because it means you have your parents with you for all those years. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so aware of the privilege it is to, to get frustrated with our elder parents. 
um, you know, especially at this moment when we're so aware of the vulnerability of our seniors. Um, but I, I also feel like, like in, in this part of the world, we're not really good at, at talking about it. We're not good at thinking about it. Um, and even though like my sister and I knew we had to have that talk, like we couldn't do it. Yeah, and so uh, I, I I wish that there had been a way that that the door had opened a little bit for us. In any case, I didn't want to perform that. I tried to give it away. I really I tried to give it to another actress and said, "No, you should do it. You should do it." And she was like, "I don't think so. I think this is a story you have to tell." Oh, that's great. So uh, it's been great. I I've done it. Um, I did it at the uh, Guthrie in Minneapolis. I've, I've done it twice now in Boston. I did it uh, for Arts Emerson and then it came back a few years later for Huntington. Um, and, uh, and now there's this really quite lovely um, uh, film version of it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a live capture, but it had a bunch of cameras and it's very nice quality. So, so you, you, you oh, and also, sorry, it's available on Audible too. Available oh. on Audible and in Spanish on Audible. Oh, fantastic. So. So you've, you've touched on a, a, a couple of your um, major works in your life that, that are out there. When you think about the theater and, you know, we're shut down right now, but we can't even do it. Um, what experiences or experience, and I'll put you on the spot a little bit, comes to your mind that makes you know why we have to come back? And why it's super important that we get back up and performing because what we do is important for the world. Is there something that jumps to your mind when I say that, that goes, this is something that happened to me either in one of my plays or in something I experienced? Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sort of flooded with sensation and uh, a, a number of different memories. And um, um, I think, the, the thing I will start with is um, like uh, we're a culture that craves stories. We love stories, right? But I think, I think theater and in particular um, um, great narratives help us make sense of chaos. Like it's more than just consuming, like I'm, you know, I'm binging The Good Place right now. I'm binging West Wing right now. Like I, I love streaming TV shows, but I think um, bigger narratives help us make sense of chaos. We, we have to talk about what happened to us, right? And I think theater does that really well. Um, uh, it's, it's not only limited to the story it's also the experience of being in the theater with people which we can't do right now right. but it's the collective moment of suspension when the lights go out and you're sitting in the dark for a minute and everyone is thinking what's going to happen and it's when the lights come up and the actors are there and and they're feeling and they're falling in love and they're yelling at each other and they're crying and they're fighting and they're and they're emoting and and it's washing over us it's like i just read this um great article about you know why um sorry why zoom makes us tired um and 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 it's because we're only getting this much information yeah whereas we're like there's a whole there's a whole sensory experience that that the screen can't capture and um, as successful as it is for us right now that thing of, of being in the room and having the conversations that come afterwards right it, it, it's like the sandwich right it's the before the play the play and then after the play that all of those things are really necessary so this, 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 is, this is kind thousands of thousands of years, right? Thousands of years. Our, our intermediate fix, right? Right. Because we can't do do it for real. It, it's and, like I I haven't seen you in several years, and it's lovely to be looking lovely. at your face right now. It's so great. However, it's not the same. Yeah. As, as being in the room. And you know, and just in terms of following up your question, um, I would also add that you know I feel like in many ways the best experiences for me have been after the show, talking to people. Yeah. 
um, like my, uh, with uh, Sonia Flu, um, people saying, you know, my family's from China and uh, we experienced the same thing, um, um, uh, that it's not in the, uh, that, that humans are humans around the world. And so um, those moments where, where you get to really connect with someone's oh, with like three dimensions, their souls, yeah. um, uh, that's what I miss yeah. and, and what we have to keep going. So one last question for you, and, yeah. and I haven't asked you this, so I don't know. Is there something new coming? Are you working on something now? Is there uh, plans for it? Um, I have been working with folks at Audible to create um, a, a long form fictional piece um, that's set in two timelines, the um, uh, 1980 and the Mariel Boatlift and 2019 and uh, right now. So it's, there's two immigration stories um, and, uh, and then they um, come together and what we find is that um, people in the contemporary world um, have ties to the past. But so there's this, again, this huge epic um, uh, historical event that uh, ties together uh, the history of Cuba and the history of the United States when, um, you know, 125,000 Cubans fled um, uh, Marielle and their boats and came to Miami and and it and it's not unlike the conversations we're having now about um, um, what does immigration look like in 2020 yeah. um, uh, and um, you know um, the uh, spoiler alert you know the Marielle boat lift turned out okay <laughs> I will right, say right. things ended up okay um, so well, you, uh, you, you do well with with those big issues like yeah. you know Castro taking over Cuba and yeah. parents having to make the decision to send their kids out and then what do you do with a dead little dog in a bathroom? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, um, truth is stranger than fiction. I mean that you know that really happened, and I thought well, this is a play. I think, <laughs> and I'm glad I, it was. We had fun with that one. I, 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 I miss you seeing you. How are I'm you? I'm looking forward to being in the same place with you again at some time and Me working too. on another of your plays at some point. And um, thank you for talking with me today and, and sharing a little bit about you with the North Coast Rep audience. Please go uh, see Mala and, um, and I can't wait to talk to you about it. And yeah, let's, let's, make, some, let's make some theater. Okay. It's let's a deal. do that. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.